Are you reaching your divine destiny? Prayer, faith, holiness are key to reaching your destiny. Join Prophet Nana Seyopokusa Kodye get you closer to your God in prayer. Behind every greatness in the kingdom is connected to grace. Apostle Paul said, I am not doing this because I'm studying with Gamera, the best university. He said, I am what I am by the grace of God. So if you don't recognize the grace, it will tell you to grasp. Oh, somebody give the Lord a shout. Don't look at me, so we have already preached. What you hear from man is information. What you hear from God is revelation. Revelation is the matter and the foundation for faith. So without revelation, the struggle continues. Father, we give your glory and honor. We praise your mighty name. And I ask in Jesus' name that your name be glorified. Move in our midst today. We ask for spiritual instruction that your holy name should be praised in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated and God bless. Hallelujah. Well, it's good to see all of you Sunday morning. I was thinking about what to preach here and I, I just felt, I just felt that because this is a prophetic ministry and it's a prayer ministry with a lot of spiritual things that happen here, maybe talking on this subject of the fear factor, understanding spirituals will be helpful. Everybody say understanding spirituals. Come on, say it again, understanding spirituals. Many people, even charismatics and Pentecostals, are very ignorant when it comes to spiritual things. Also, it's good to see you this morning, and madam. Many Christians are afraid of spiritual things. And these days it's becoming worse. I remember when the Ebola thing came. People were talking about how to solve it. And then I'm reading articles. Ebola is not about prayer. So we have even dismissed prayer as a way of handling Ebola. If you go right now and quote, they shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. People say you are a lunatic. I'm telling you gradually, we are killing the power of the spirit in the church. How many of you know the, the Holy Ghost is omnipotent? Holy Spirit is omnipotent. Yeah. How many of you believe that you can stop God from moving? Only few. How many of you know the Holy Spirit is God? But how many of you know you can quench the spirit. If you quench the spirit, you have stopped God from moving. So you see, God can be stopped. The word of God is all powerful. But Jesus told the Pharisees, with your traditions, you have made the word of God of non effect. <laughs> Do you know that grace can be frustrated? Paul talked about the people 
who frustrate the grace of God. And the Bible said that the word being preached did not profit some people because it was not mixed with what? Faith. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when you see people jumping and thinking that the things of God are automatic, you are deceiving yourself. I just did a meeting in London and I talked about the move of the spirit. One night, I spoke about falling under the power. There was a gentleman there, some thick, robust young man. He, he doesn't believe in things like that. And I talked about people who are not responsive when the Holy Ghost moves. He has never experienced any physical manifestation of the Spirit all his life. But the way I spoke about it that day, I, I said, if you don't respond to the Holy Spirit, you are dead. You are insensitive. You, you have no faith. When I diagnosed his infirmity. <laughs> because you know, some people think if they don't fall, if they don't feel anything, they think they are spiritually matured. Or oh, I'm matured. I'm not emotional. I don't respond to things like women. You are not matured. You are sick. Now, let me ask you. If it's raining right now and you don't feel the rain, are you mature? If there's fire in this building and you don't feel the fire, are you mature? You are sick. So if the Holy Ghost like rain, the Holy Ghost like fire, the Holy Ghost like wind is blowing and moving and you don't feel it, you are mature. There's a dysfunction somewhere. And when you have a dysfunction, it leads to a disconnect. So because you are dysfunctional, it has disconnected you from spiritual reality. When I started the ministration, this guy was standing at the back. He was feeling nothing. He said, ah, ah. The preacher just said, there's something wrong with me. He said, Lord, today I must connect into this thing. Then he started making confessions. I must connect. I must connect. I must connect. Before he realized the Holy Ghost had carried him. We finished the meeting. Two hours after the meeting, the guy was on the stage alone. Jumping. Throwing his hands. The Holy Ghost carried him almost the whole night. Because you know what? Even when it comes to healing, until you say, I am healed, you don't receive it. Even salvation, until you say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Because with the heart, a man believes unto righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And faith without works is dead. So you can sit in this building, be in a prophetic ministry all your life, and you yourself will never prophesy. Oh, you can sit around this great prophet and never prophesy. Some of you can sit around this great man of God and never lead a prayer meeting for even two minutes. And that is because you are an observer of the things of God instead of a participator of the things of God. And may I suggest that even Simon the sorcerer is better than you. At least Simon the sorcerer, when he saw that by the laying on of hands, the Holy Ghost was giving. He offered them money and said, take this money so that whoever I lay hands on, the person will be filled with the Holy Ghost. At least Simon had the desire to lay hands on somebody to receive the Holy Ghost. Now, you see, is he not better than you who have never desired to lay hands on anybody? And some of you, even when they are laying hands on people, you don't want to get involved. What do you say? Mm, 
These days there are many false prophets. There are, there are many good people who have run away from God because they say there are many false prophets. And they have popular scriptures they quote. In the last days, false prophets <laughs> shall appear. And they have another popular statement, watch and pray. So when they are in church and say, shall we pray? They, they close one eye, open the other. They are watching and pray. Can I hear an amen there? Yeah. So they say, watch, watch and pray. Be careful. Then they'll tell you, it's not all that glitters. That is gold. And they say, be very careful. These days there are many wolves in sheep clothing. But there are also sheep. Sometimes, with your unbelief, you see them like wolves. So you see, sheep, wolves can wear sheep clothing to deceive. But you can also be deceived to see sheep like wolf. So men of God can stand in front of you and instead of seeing them as men of God, you see them as agents of the devil. A prophet can stand in front of you and you think he's a charlatan. Our faith has been so weakened that these days when you go to church, you don't even know what to believe. Many of you sit inside church and your spiritual car, the reverse gear is engaged. All you need is to step on your accelerator and you go backwards. Sometimes you go, <laughs> you go to a house and they've written on the gate, beware of wild dogs. Huh? Some of you come to church and it is beware. When they say it is time for offering, hey, beware, oh. beware, beware, beware. When they say there is somebody here, say, mm -mm. beware. They are going to tell me that everybody in my family is a witch. I'm not going forward. So, your reverse gear is engaged. Some of you are on perpetual breaks. Nothing can put you into motion. Am I talking to somebody at all? Fear. My aim this morning is to release you from fear so that you will benefit from this ministry. Listen, my aim and purpose and assignment this morning is to let you enjoy this house. Because sometimes, you know, when people belong to a teaching ministry, they make you think that everything about the Bible is teaching. But everything about the Bible is not teaching. Everything about the Bible is God. God before teaching. It is not what you know about the Bible that is important. It is the God you know who is revealed in the Bible that is important. You can, you can read about God, but you don't know him. We are quenching the spirit. And so unbelievers, carnal people, natural people, unbelieving believers, sit in church, go about in church, they don't believe anything spiritual. What makes it worse is when preachers themselves become fire service people, Carrying spiritual fire extinguishers, extinguishing the fire of the Holy Ghost anywhere they can see it. They are on radio and television and everywhere. Beware of false prophets. Beware of all this Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost thing. Beware of all this prayer, prayer thing. You know what we are doing? We are quenching the spirit. And we'll quote from the Hebrew, quote from the Greek. And these are very respectable people. So when they speak, you are forced to believe. The Bible said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and the verse number 19, quench not the spirit. 
Everybody say, quench not the spirit. Come on, shout it again, quench not the spirit. Say it again, quench not the spirit. Wow. Now, there are, there are many kinds of, there are many ways by which you can quench the spirit. And there are many things that will quench the spirit. But one thing that quenches the spirit a lot is fear. Fear can quench the spirit. Many of the people you say, you see and they tell you, hey, be careful about these spiritual things, blah, blah, blah. A lot of it is fear. And the reason why that fear is there is because, number one, we don't, we, we have no faith in God. And then number two, we are suspicious of other people. The fear manifests itself in the lack of faith and the lack of trust. Because when you have love in you, you trust. When you have love in you, there's no fear. The Bible said there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. And he that feareth is not made perfect in love. When you love and your heart is full of love, you don't walk in fear. I have had many occasions where people ask me, oh, a man of God, blah, 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 blah. Is the person of God, I say, why are you asking? Then they say, the person did this and did this and did this, some spiritual things. And I'm like, I don't know. I refuse to become a judge of another person's anointing and calling. Um, if you love, if you, if you walk in love, you don't walk about as, don't make yourself the kingdom policeman. Who is walking about inspecting those who are of God and those who are not? Say on your papa, police the chief. But if God has not recruited you as a policeman, but He recruited you as an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher, stay on your calling and allow other people to do what God has called them to do. Because incidentally, what they are doing, you don't understand it. If you go into the realm of a fetish priest, you will never understand what the fetish priest is doing. The same way, if a man of God is operating and he's operating by the spirit, if that is not your domain and realm of operation, you can't understand it. For example, if you've never seen an open vision, and there are many believers who haven't seen an open vision before. If you haven't seen an open vision before, it is very difficult to judge open visions. If you have never prophesied, you cannot judge prophecies. If you are not very spiritual, it's very difficult to judge in cases like that. But we allow all the fear and the doubt and everything. And there are many believers, apart from, you know, I'm talking about you receiving the ministry of the spirit. But one of my worries is not you receiving. One of my major worries is, when will you also flow in the things of the Spirit? You have observed it for far too long. To be honest with you, if you come and you are in this church, and after four years you've never prophesied, uh, and I know there are many of you who have no hope, of ever prophesying. Huh? Many of you can be in church for 10 years and never preach one message. Fear. Fear. Number one fear is the fear of making mistakes. There are, there are many people here, younger people, who are coming after prophet and God will be calling them into ministry. Some of you, God will be calling you into spiritual things. I believe that the most important thing about church is spiritual things. Um, I believe that we are here and church is a training center to flow in the spirit. Now watch this. Whosoever believes in me, out of his belly shall what? Flow rivers of water. The most important thing about you as a believer is your spiritual life. Breakthrough 
is when the heavens open and the Holy Ghost comes upon you and these signs shall follow them that believe. Breakthrough is when the heavens open and the Holy Ghost comes upon you and like Jesus, you will liberate those that are in prison, recover the sight of the blind, heal the sick, preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Brethren, listen, the day you preach your first message, you are broken through. A car is not a breakthrough. A wedding is not a breakthrough. Buying a house is not a breakthrough. Buying land is not a breakthrough. Getting university professor and doctorate is not a breakthrough. A breakthrough is when the heavens are open. A breakthrough is when God speaks concerning your life. A breakthrough is when in the realm of the spirit you have made a mark and God's approval is upon you and the devil also takes notice that you are walking on the face of the earth. That is what we call a breakthrough. Man of God, I've been listening to testimonies in churches. In meetings. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I was believing God for a car. I got it. I was believing God for a land. I got it. How many times do you hear testimonies in even the most spiritual churches? And an ordinary member says, I was walking in town. I saw a madman. I laid out on him and the man recovered. How many times do you hear, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I was walking at the lorry station. I saw four men. They were sitting down. They were drinking beer. I went and sat with them. I witnessed to them. They gave their life to Christ. All these spiritual testimonies are getting lost. The church is becoming physical, secular, if you permit me, worldly. Our appetite for spiritual things is gone. We don't look at a prophet with the hope of becoming a prophet. We look at a prophet with the hope of admiring him and depending on him forever. We don't go to our pastors for counseling because we need the impartation of the spirit that is on their life. We go to them to complain so that when we finish, they'll give us money. To the point that associate pastors in churches don't look at their senior pastor with the hope of receiving the anointing that is on him. They go to their senior pastor with the hope that 2,000, 3,000 Ghana cities. But the love of money is the root of all evil. If people were following senior pastors because of spiritual things, the breakaways would not be so much in our churches. But they are following the senior pastor because they want a day day to have a building like this. We'll, we'll also become founder and general overseer of a church. They are not there because they want to flow in the gift of the spirit, work for God, live a life that is worthy of emulation. Now, so we have so many kinds of fears. And the, the first fear is the fear of making mistakes. No, many are scared of making a mistake. What about if I prophesy and God is not in it? Hmm. If I prophesy and God is not in it. What about if I make a mistake and die? Because presumption has no place in the things of the spirit. Huh? So people are scared of making mistakes. And you read in the Bible that Uzzah, the ark of God was shaking. And Uzzah touched it and fell down and died. So you are like, hey, Namina. I should go and take a microphone when God has not called me and I'll fall down and die. So we are afraid of mistakes. But ladies and gentlemen, ministry is not for perfection. People don't, listen, people don't do ministry because they are perfect. They do ministry because they appreciate the mercy of God. 
For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But he was in all points tempted like as we are and yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find the grace to help in time of need. May you receive the grace for ministry. May you receive mercy for ministry. God will not tolerate it if you are walking in presumption. He will not tolerate it if you are walking in deception. But I believe that he makes room for your mistakes. God makes room for your mistakes. No matter who you are, when you start a ministry, you make a mistake. If you are prophesying, you will start as, uh, as immature. When you were starting to walk as a child, you used to fall and get up. When you were starting to talk, you, you pronounce words and people needed a computer to interpret what you pronounce. My son Archibald, Archibald, when Archie was born, his name is Archibald. They asked him, what is your name? He said, Ba Pomba. <laughs> How can Archibald be Ba Pomba? And then when you now ask, what did you say your name is? He said, Ba Pomba, Ba Pomba. <laughs> How Ba Pomba is related to Archibald, only God knows. <laughs> but that is a child learning to speak in the things of ministry flowing in the spirit there will be mistakes in the formation of a church doing things of god we can start a church and because we are young church there will be mistakes in the church you can say shall we turn to john chapter 6 verse that and they will open the bible and it's not there Some people, when they open and it's not there, they get confused. Somebody said, but brothers, whenever you do that, what do you do? I, I, it has happened to me a number of times. Somebody said, so what did you do? When they get there and it's not the one, the one they see, I will work with it. Okay? So if I'm talking and I say, okay, Jesus went and sat by the well and a woman came to him and then they were talking and then Jesus said that and that and that and then, you know, at the well was good and then, and then I said, shall we turn to John chapter 5? Verse something. And then they turned there and it is Jesus rather and the important man at the pool of Bethesda. I switched direction. You know, I don't know, because I, I'm ministering by the Spirit, I'm moving. So I'm not going to stand there and say, hey, I made a mistake. Um, shall we rather look for the thing? And everybody's panicking in the room. <laughs> when you are ministering, you are, like an, you are like a driver or a pilot. Pilot don't come across clouds and say, hey, excuse me, I'm, meet, I'm meeting clouds I didn't plan for. So... <laughs> uh, so people are like, oh, what about if I make a mistake? And then, they have all these scriptures they use. Anybody who adds to this book, the plagues written in the book will be added to his life. And anybody who subtracts from them, his name will be taken from the book of life. Because of that, they are scared. Then they tell you, if you say the Lord has said, and God didn't say, people are holding on to these things. And because of that fear, they can minister. But I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, ministry will always be risky. Even in natural things, we make a mistake. In the things of the spirit, sometimes things happen. Now, close to the fear of making mistakes is the fear of failure. Everybody say the fear of failure. Come on, say it again. The fear of failure. People are afraid they will fail. What about if I fail? What about if I fail? 
Any minister who tells you, after ministering for a number of years, that nothing has failed in his hand before, he may be deceiving you. I know there are some perfect ministers who have never failed. I don't belong to that group. The first time I attempted to have a cripple walk, by the time I was through with the man, he was more crippled than when we started. I, I gathered my prayer warriors about 10. And I said, today the man will walk. And I really believed he was going to walk. We went to this man's house. He was sitting in his wheelchair. I said, <laughs> I said you will walk. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. The man was looking at him. I lifted him up, released him, he fell. I said, in Jesus' name, you will walk. I struggled with this man. Finally. I said the people who were standing around, they were unbelievers. They should leave. We carried the man into a room. I continued screaming, you will walk. Hours. The guy was getting more crippled. I didn't stop. Until... I was so exhausted, I knew if I didn't stop, I myself would be crippled. You understand? I, I had to stop it. And then we put the man back in his wheelchair. And I left. You get the point? But on other occasions, when I didn't even intend for somebody to walk, the power fell on the people and they would get up themselves and start walking. So in ministry, there are occasions when you come across something, let me say, that looks like a failure. Because sometimes, in the eyes of God, it is not a failure. I'll give you an example. Gehazi had a report. Elisha had a report that the Shunammite woman's son was dead. He took his staff, which was a miracle working staff, put it in the hand of Gehazi and said, go and raise the boy. Gehazi went and put the rod on the boy and the boy did not get up. Gehazi struggled, the boy did not get up. The man of God now came, went up. He didn't use the staff. He lay on the boy and the boy sneezed, came back to life. Now I want to ask, didn't Gehazi as a prophet know that the staff would not work? He didn't know. The staff had been used to work miracles on other occasions, but this time the power was not in the staff. God's methodology had changed, but the prophet did not know so, when you minister and the person is not healed, the power of God has not failed, but maybe you as a minister did not get the methodology right. And then second, it might not have been God's ordained counsel for you in particular to be the one he will use to heal this man. Are you telling me that there is no possibility that the cripple who Peter raised at the gate, beautiful, in the temple. There is a likelihood that when Jesus was alive and was on earth, Jesus saw that cripple. Maybe some of the times Jesus went to the temple, the cripple was there. But probably Jesus didn't heal him because this was Peter's hunting to do and not Jesus' own. So you know what? All sick people will be healed. But some of them will be healed by God using a doctor. Some will be used by God using their father or their mother or their brothers or their sisters to pray for them. Some will be healed by God using you. Some will be healed by God using another preacher. Therefore, when you pray for somebody and the person is not healed, continue your life. 
Let God do what he has to do. Can I hear you shout an amen? amen? So the fear of making mistakes has kept many people from doing the work of God. They, they, are, they are scared. What about if I make a mistake? What about if the thing fails? Let me give you another example of the fear of failure. Elijah the prophet is expecting rain. God said, rain is coming. Then the man of God told his servant, he said, go and look at the clouds. The rain is coming. The servant went and looked and came back and said, there's nothing. He said, go again. He said, there's nothing. He said, go again. He said, there's nothing. Go again. There's nothing. Six times, nothing. Seventh time. The man came and said, I see the cloud like the hand of a man. And he said, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. They had to go seven times. Sometimes as a preacher, you have to call a word of knowledge seven times. And nobody's coming forward. But if you have no faith and you have been moved in that realm of life before, after the second call, all your faith will disappear. Hey, now dear with me, I cannot be anywhere. My ministry is good. And there are times, eh, you may even call and nobody will respond. And that is because I have seen ministrations where the demons kept the person from responding. I have been in a meeting before where I gave a word of knowledge. Somebody was going to commit suicide. I called and called and called and called. Nobody responded. After the meeting, that same day, the person went and committed the suicide. And then the person's friends told me, told the pastor, that when I was giving that word of knowledge, the person was fast asleep. They woke him up. He wouldn't wake up. So they left him. But I could have gone home condemning myself that my word of knowledge was not correct. That is why I just me bore word of knowledge now. My job is to say it. My job is not to respond. So, when I say it and finish, I'm not worried about whether somebody responded or didn't respond. Now, when it comes to preaching, my job is to preach. My job is not to let you obey. So if it comes to word of knowledge, my job is to preach, not to force you to respond. Cripple, my job is to say walk, not to walk for you. The blind, my job is to say see, not to see for you. I'm done. Oh, so if he's really a man of God, he, he will let me know. Even Jesus, when the people came to him, he asked them, the crippled man, 30, 80 years, at the pool of Bethesda, he said, what do you want me to do? Will you be made whole? You have been here for all these years. Do you really want to walk? That day, if the man did not declare an intent to walk, Jesus would have helped him to lie there. But the man said, I have no man to take me and put me in the water. In other words, Ure, I want to walk, but Charlie, the things hard. And Jesus said, rise up, take up your bed walk. Because that is what you really want. The fear of what? Failure. One day, I was doing a meeting at um, what is the name? Global. That, that meeting was in Achimota. I laid hands on, I prayed for people, I prayed a general prayer for people's eyes to open. Somebody's eyes opened and the person came and told me, he said, Reverend, my eyes couldn't see, but now the eye is open 
and I can see you, but I'm seeing you from your shoulders downwards. I can't see your head. This kind of seeing power, seeing decapitated people. <laughs> this can see him, but they are not alive. Cha! Can you imagine seeing only your wife's body, but not the head? Now, could you cry? You body So I laid hands on the eyes now. I prayed the general prayer. The eyes were open. She can see me, but she sees me from here down, not the head. I laid hands on the eyes again and I said, Lord, let him see completely. When I finished, he looked at me. He said, now I can see you from head to toe. <laughs> now, the first attempt could have discouraged me. But I remembered that even Jesus himself, a man said he wanted to see. When Jesus laid hands on him, he said, what do you see? He said, I see men like trees walking. My own is even better. <laughs> In my case, they were seeing human beings without the head. Now, human beings have become baobab trees and neem trees. <laughs> Not standing, walking. Am I preaching to you at all? I see men like trees walking. Jesus could have said, I have failed. But he laid hands on the man the second time. And the man saw clearly. So even Jesus, there was a time he had to pray twice for a man to see. The fear of mistakes. Let me tell you, the difference between you and the people that are walking in the spirit on a daily basis is that they don't fear mistakes. I have a friend who is in the ministry, very anointed man of God. When you ask him, Sofo, at the or see GDA, any patapa, and go on. GDA, any patapa. What I'm saying is that when it comes to the things of ministry, if you want to follow your self-respect and self-respect dignity, well, what about if I say it and it's not there? What if I say it and this? You will never minister. Never. Doctors, lawyers, soldiers, businessmen, there are times they are not very sure. There is a risk element in whatever they do. You can be given a word of knowledge from your spirit and your mind is fighting it. Why do you think a prophet sometimes will ask, who is, who is, I'm a, 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 or I'm a, or I'm a something. Why do they normally ask that? Sometimes the word is coming but there are many other things in your spirit. There are many other things. In fact, when, when a man stands in front of people to minister, there are too many things. Your spirit is active. The environment is active. Your mind is active. Your emotions are there. You will have to work through all these things. And, and it's, 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 it's not guesswork. But it is a human being operating in the spirit realm. Uh -huh. If the person was a full spirit, operating in spiritual realm is not a problem. Whenever you take sugar and put it in water, it takes time to dissolve. The human being is like the sugar. The water is the spirit medium. Okay. So some of you, you are waiting for the day you will get up and there is no doubt whatsoever in you. Oh, you get up and God is sitting in front of you like Prophet Nana said. Then you can go to God's hand and say, Hey, Jack, and you say, Hey, Jack, no, no, hey, Jack, hey, Jack, no, what to me? Oh, hey, Jack, we are boy. Hey, Jack, hey, Jack. You can get to that point. 
in terms of open visions. But sometimes it doesn't start like that. We see faintly as through a glass. We prophesy in part. And we know in part. You will have things to deal with. But may God give us risk taking ministers. That is why I normally tell people who are not into the ministrations of the spirit that. You know what? Be charitable and gentle with the people who pay the price and take the risk to walk in some of these areas. Because you know, they are paying a price. Though. Or like maybe you see somebody doing an anointing service and you just start criticizing the person. Do you know what they meet? When I'm ministering in Accra and those places, I don't see a lot of reaction. But sometimes in Bogatanga, not, not sometimes, Bogatanga, it is constant feature. Because I come from there, and the principalities and the powers on the land, we are acquaintances. I didn't say friends, we are acquaintances, and we are also neighbors. I normally tell my wife, I tell her, I say, the devil knows me, I know him. And the principalities, we know ourselves. They know what they are dealing with. I know what I'm dealing with. Mm. One day I was ministering. One of the ushers, he never comes near me. He's an usher, but he ushers from the back. Then one day, one respectable woman in our church asked him, they said, why don't you ever go near Daddy Wengi's ministry? He said, "More me, you want to tempt me? <laughs> eh? I should go near this man. Have you been hearing him when he's ministry? Devil, principality, I take authority. There, there's a spirit here. Then he said, "Mommy, I should go near him. Then the devil will see me with him. <laughs> and then when we close the church, he will go to his house and I will go home alone. And the devil will not come. And say, hey, were you the one with you? standing with that person? This man is ministering. The devil is a liar. I take authority over the devil. I rebuke foul spirit. He said, Mommy, I should go near him. He said, mm -mm, I'm standing at the back. Satan is not going to see me close to this man. I usher the people I go. I don't walk within that fiery range. A man is a wise man. And that's because you know what, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of ministry, we come across things. Borga is the place I'll be ministering, anointing service. I will get to somebody and the person will just stand. The eyes will be like fire. Look at me. It's to the number. Who do you think you are? Why are you disturbing us like this? Give us peace. On this land, give us peace. And I look at them and say, I am a native of the Upper East region. By you, what is your identity? I command you foul spirit in the name of Jesus. Just shut up and come out of here. Do you remember Jesus I know and Paul I know? Sometimes the devil just wants you to know who you are. By you, who are you? They say, eh, we, we, are, uh -huh, we heard Paul preach and mentioning some Jesus, he said, I we are numb. <laughs> Am I talking to somebody at all? So, let's move to the next one. The fear of criticism. You want to minister in the spirit, but there are these people who are ready to criticize you. And most of these people who criticize you they don't even know what the tail of the devil looks like. They've never seen a vision, but they comment on it. They've never prophesied, but they run commentary on prophecy. They are like Harry Thompson. Eh? What is the name of that popular commentator? Many years ago, was he Harry Thompson? There was another one. Harry Thompson. 
and Joe Latte. Joe Latte was popular, but there was some very good one, Harry Thompson, in the days of the Fierce on Five. House of, House of Oaks of Porters. That, that was the time we used to enjoy the football. Oh, you are Asante Kotoko. Phobia. Mama Aqua on the ball. Finds Thomas yours. He beats one man. Mohamed Polo on the touchline. He beats one man, beats the second man, turns around, finds Adolf Amar, the midfield dynamo, Mama Aqua, Adan Sedu, Thomas Hammond, Mama Aqua, Peter Lamte, Mama Aqua on the ball, turns around, Adan Sedu, Mama Aqua, Mohamed Polo is a goal! <laughs> Meanwhile, this guy standing there shouting is a goal, has never kicked the ball. But and when things are not going well, my oh my, I cannot believe what is going on. A crowd of folk torn into shreds. They look like basketball players. A crowd of folk. I, I almost made a mistake. I thought they were playing hockey. You've never kicked a ball. You are running commentary. Sometimes you see a pastor criticizing the move of the spirit he's never experienced it never never experienced it. never experienced it. and they call everybody everybody who moves in the spirit they call them sinners do you know when Jesus came he talked about the Pharisees and he said they devour widows and they invade their houses as concubines and pretend to make long prayers. So some of the Pharisees themselves were sinners. And when Jesus came and was working miracles, all they used to criticize him. This is a friend of sinners, a wine biber. Hey. One day Jesus healed a man who was born blind. I thought they would clap for him. They called the blind man. They say, oh, give God the praise. But as for this man, who healed you of the blindness? The man is a sinner. But I like this man. You see, this man, he was born blind. So I don't think he went to Legon or KNUST. Sometimes you can have uncommon sense. Sometimes you, you may not have uncommon sense, but you can have common sense. Some of the people, they have uncommon sense. In other words, they are too wise. They are so wise in uncommon sense that common sense has eluded them. This man was not endowed with uncommon sense, but he has common sense. He said, they said, as for this man, he's a sinner. You need some kind of binoculars, microscope, telescope in order to know who a sinner is. And you need some discerning devices. Maybe you need some litmus paper to know the acidity or alkalinity of the man's spirit, whether it's a sinner or not. This man did not have any reagents to tell a sinner from a righteous person, but he had common sense. He said, the man who healed me, I don't even know him. But that man, whether he's a sinner or he's not a sinner, I don't know. The only person I know is me. I was blind. But now, I see. Oh, don't follow these pastors. They are liars. I don't know. I was a sinner. But now, I am saved. I couldn't sleep for one straight week. But now, I sleep for a month and for three months without any torture. Some time ago, I used to be on marijuana, but when I listened to that preacher, I was loosed. My life was not going the right direction, but since I listened to that word, I can tell you now, I am born again. Now, I am saved. Now, 
I am delivered. Now I know the Lord. Now I was in darkness, but now I am in the light. As for the man, what you are saying about him, what you are saying about her, I don't know. But what I know is that once upon a time, I was blind, but now I see. They have their own testimony. But I believe you have your own testimony. You have your own evidence why you continue coming to church. You have your own evidence why you believe in this man of God. You have your own evidence why you follow Jesus. We have our own story. If you have your own testimony, come and clap your hands and shout it and praise God. You have your own testimony. You have your own story. That is what everybody say. But what do you say? Some said Elijah. Some said Jeremiah. Some said one of the prophets. One confused one said John the Baptist raised from the dead. That must be a, that must be a, a Confucianist perfected. Because how can you say it's John the Baptist when the man is only about six months older than John the Baptist? A younger than John the Baptist. And they were cousins and they were at the river Jordan together. And he said, this is the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. Now you say it's John the Baptist risen from the dead. Are you not confused? Sometimes the people spread the rumors. They can say some things. And when you hear, you want to ask yourself, am I the one they are talking about or they are talking about somebody else? But Jesus asked him a question. He said, But you, who do you say I am? May God be true. And may every man be a liar. Some of us sometimes can even stop going to church because of criticism. One day, some people accused Jesus. They said, He's casting out devils with Beelzebub. Every man of God, they will accuse you of using magical powers. The only man of God they will not criticize is if you can open the Bible decently and teach it decently without offense but loaded with compromise. <laughs> there is a way you can teach the Bible and it will be nice. But the Bible is not a nice book. Mokotos yele tata. John said they gave me a book and when I ate the book it was bitter in my mouth. But sweet in my belly. Oh, this book cannot be palatable all the time. Jesus is not nice to some people. He is an occasion for stumbling, a stumbling block, an offense to some people. The preaching of the cross cannot be enticing, foolishness to some people, but to you. The power of God Almighty. <laughs> Criticism. There is no anointed person. People won't criticize. No, 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 no. It goes with it. Jesus was casting out devils. They said he's casting out devils with Beelzebub. Cha. I remember when we started our ministry in Bogatanga, the power of God was moving. Then pastors took me into their churches. Hey, pastors. Oh. They said, I have dwarfs. And in those days, the praise and worship, I had this fanatical young man who used to come to church with whistles. As soon as we started the praise, of, uh, praise and worship, on the mountain, in the valley, on the land, and in the sea, then this my young man will take their, their whistles. Prr, 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 prr. So the pastors took me into their puppies. They said, I went to India and I have brought some dwarfs. When I blow the whistle, the dwarfs come and start pushing the people to the ground. And then I came to Accra, I thought it would be better. When I remove a handkerchief and hit somebody's face and he falls under the power, he said, Aye. 
akwani firi esire mo esire yeah it comes from the north and you know the north hey the believers oh the people from the hey this is for the north is wild eh? several years ago anybody who wanted juju they went to the north until they started realizing that if juju can develop a land the north will be more developed than the south <laughs> so we now realize that the juju is imf instead of the north so we now go to imf instead of going to the north I'm just saying something. Criticism. Oh, they will criticize you. When you dress, they say, oh, what dress it to do? When you don't dress, they say it's like a madman. Hey. So they'll criticize. It's you too. When the church is not growing, they say, oh, nyamiapur. When the church is growing, they say, I deal with bad here. Something they under. <laughs> Criticism. When you don't pray, they say he's prayerless. When you pray to, they say he's praying too much. It's not easy. When you are always in public, they say, Akoi, dear friend of sinners, wine Bible, fornicator. When you hide like John the Baptist, you say, This guy is an ascetic person. He's weird. The guy is weird. He hides in darkness until he comes out in the night. Sorry, until he comes out in the daytime to come and minister. Criticism. So here is Jesus. They said, The man is white, wine Bible. They said all kinds of things. The other fear people have is the fear of being a novice. Everybody say a novice. Uh, where sometimes you think you are too young. And then they show the person is too young. He can't handle this. He cannot do this. She's too young. She can't handle spiritual responsibility. I remember I got born again in 1980. By 1981, I was in the university, K and USD. When I went there, after one year of being born again, they made me the chapel keeper of my hall in the fellowship. So by the time the chapel keeper thing ended, I was about two years old in the faith. Then the executive of the fellowship came and said, they have elected me to be the vice president of the whole fellowship. I told them, I said, please, I'm a convert. I'm a novice. I'm only two years old in the faith. But I'm young. No, because I was two years old in the faith with a lot of noise. When you say, shall we pray? I go, mon kololobosia, biriangodosi. When you are standing by me, you have to stop, examine my prayer, and find your level. And people thought I was old in the faith. I was not old in the faith, but it was because of the thing that was chasing me. The idols I had repented from. My father had told me I'm a dead man. I can't live long. Because I've rejected the idols. So when I go to the meeting and they say, shall we pray? And somebody standing by me, who is the son of a deacon in the Presby Church? Another person is standing by me whose father is a long-standing Methodist. One is in front of me. His uncle is the Church of Pentecost elder. One is behind me. His father just founded a charismatic church. These four people are saved by a spiritual inheritance. I am standing in the middle just coming from idols, pythons and snakes. So when they say, shall we pray? And don't go, mili keboshi Gubruza. <laughs> and then they add <laughs> Kabruz. In my case, because of where I'm coming from, when they say, Shall we pray? Because you know what? I know what is chasing me. I prayed the loudest. 
I shouted the light loudest, like blind Bartimaeus, have mercy on me, Jesus of Nazareth. In the prayer they call you see me. And I'm leading prayer. And I'm preaching. And I'm witnessing. The Holy Ghost will come on me. I will receive everything. I will read my Bible cover to cover twice a year. Genesis to Revelation. Bam. I'll finish it and take it again and finish it. My scriptures, I will memorize them. I, I read almost any Christian book I've come across. Especially A.W. Toza. I read Toza until I could memorize Toza. A.W. Toza. Look, I read and I was so zealous. I fell into Jehovah's Witness books. I thought they were the truth. I consumed even Jehovah. Look, after let me change Pete. Anything I saw which was spiritual, I consumed. Whether it was, brother, clean or unclean, I sanctified all and consumed them. One day I saw a large book. I didn't know it was large. They said something, something about developing spirit. And I thought it was developing my spirit. <laughs> I started reading this book. Ah! Also, I say, now me daho. Then I could feel my body as if it was going up. So I said, let me look at this book well. I showed it to one Christian brother on campus. He said, it's a large book. Others. I came across Jehovah Witness material. They said the soul is material and the soul can die. And they quoted the soul that sin it shall die. I consumed the material. And I said, oh, so the soul is not immortal after all. The soul can die. I thought it was the truth. I consumed it. Later on, a Christian sister. Then I wrote a long letter to Olivia Doce and Marian Kobo. Sharing my apple with them. My error, I thought, was apple. They waited when school reopened and I went back. They said, Eastwood, what you wrote us, we received it by his error. I said, I read it from some books. They said, bring the books. I carried my Jehovah books. <laughs> went and gave them. They said, Eastwood, please. It's not everything you see. I said, I didn't know. I didn't know. But, Osofu, I consumed everything. I was zealous. Two years old in the faith. Now they came and took me. Vice president of the whole fellowship. I said, now, nah, suppose he made a And some of these people have been in the faith for about 10 years. But I took up the responsibility. I started preparing Bible studies. I will prepare it and go and defend it. That thing was powerful. All of a sudden, measure them and off. By the following year, three years old in the faith, I was made the president of the fellowship. And that same year, I became the chairman of all the fellowships, the president of all the fellowships of all the tertiary institutions. I was the chairman of Gavis, hosting missions conferences. Three years old in the faith, four years old in the faith. That is when I was trained to become a pastor. I have never been to a Bible school. I've never attended one. By the grace of God, I've written 65 books. All of them, all of them typed by my hand. Why? Because I realized that the things of the spirit don't depend on your spiritual age. It depends on maturity. So, somebody, it depends on maturity. And the maturity doesn't depend on your age. It depends on how fast you want to learn. Somebody can be sitting in the church for 20 years and never grow. You can be in the church one year and grow. So when you start, like maybe somebody will just come up in the ministry after two years, then you see the person is moving in the spirit. 
And then people say, oh, it's just a convert. It's just a convert. Convert is not how many years you have been in the faith. It's how far you have advanced in the age. The apostle Paul warned against making a novice a leader. And the reason he gave is not because the novice doesn't know God. He said the novice will be lifted up by pride. So if you are a novice and you are young in the things of the spirit, but you can handle pride, you qualify for spiritual promotion. So, he said, don't take a novice. Then he now got to Timothy and said, don't let any man despise your youth. He said, you are a young man, Timothy, but be an example to the believers. I pray that somebody who could stop condemning yourself, sit in the faith for 10 years, 20 years, and all you are thinking is that I'm a child, I'm a child. Okay? Another thing people fear, it's lack of support. What about if I start them? What about if I go into ministry and God doesn't take care of me? Let me jump from the lack of support and let me go to chapter 6 and talk about the fear of contamination. So some people fear lack of support. What about if I go into the things of God and doesn't, God doesn't provide for me? And the fear that they will not be provided for has stopped many people from doing the things of God. Now you can imagine if you live in Bogatanga and God calls you to do the things I have to be doing there. Huh? People come to church, they see us, they come to Boga, they see our church building, they are like, ah, ah, here. An American came to Boga, I was moving around with him in the church. Then he asked me, he said, man of God, can I ask you a question? I said, yes, sir. He said, do you have any kind of then I knew what was he said. I said, support, foreign support. He said, yeah, exactly. Do you have any kind of people like maybe in America who support you? Because they believe any good thing in the world, whether Iraq or Syria, must come from America. Every good thing, whether from Afghanistan, must be America. I told him, I don't have anybody like that. He said, and you manage to do all this. I said, it's not me. Is the Lord. Is the Lord. God Himself will what? Provide. And anytime we are going to build a building, we've never built a church building or built a church property. And we had even 1,000 Ghana cities in an account to start. No, normally I receive it in my spirit. And when I receive it in my spirit, I say we should do it. I have never been used to plenty of money. I have done ministry for many, many years. God has never given me plenty of money. I don't know what it feels like. Uh, and that's because I saw Jesus' ministry. That he didn't depend on plenty of money. He depended on divine provision. So Abraham told Isaac, God himself will what? provide. Don't wait for money to marry. Some of you, the reason why you are wasting time to marry is because you are, you, you are waiting for money because you don't even understand marriage. Marriage is not a ring. It's a relationship. So if you are going to marry and you don't have money for 24 carat gold, go and look for copper that resembles gold. <laughs> The other day I was telling some people that if you are going to marry and the woman is insisting on 24 karat gold, call her and say, I'll give you karat. <laughs> Here! 24 karat. He <laughs> he! 24 times. Yeah! 24 karat. You don't need 24 karat gold to marry. There is no point in getting 24 karat gold to marry. And after that, you are owing 24 karats. <laughs> the marriage is not the ring. Show me where in the Bible it says when you are going to marry, you must have a gold ring. Show me where in the Bible it says when you are going to marry, you must cut, you must cut a, a high cake. 
wear wedding gown. Near be a wound here. Apostle, the truth is that there are many things I don't know how to do. One of the things I can't do is a wedding. I've never blessed one. Prophet, me name you. Say, Ombe Jinahi, the man is on the right or left. Me, I don't know. Then sometimes I see one is sitting here, one is sitting there. Then they change the chairs. I'm like, hey, are they away there? <laughs> then they stand in front, then they have to exchange vows. I don't, I don't know how to do it. And I haven't learned it. Somebody said, on the day of your wedding, what, do you, what did you do? I can't remember. But that day, I remember I preached myself. It was a Sunday service. And they had driven us away from our meeting place. And the church had scattered. So we succeeded in gathering on that Sunday. And I preached. And after that, I laid hands on the sick and prayed for them. Then I put on my coat. My wife too was wearing skirt suit. And they called us forward. They now prayed for us and blessed the marriage. And when we finished, there was a feeder road pickup. Yellow with blue written on the side. I carried my wife. We jumped into the pickup and went home. And then we had some rings. It was a friend of ours who made it for us with some small quantity of gold and the rest of it was presentable material. Then later on, we managed to change. And then now, okay, I have. <laughs> hey. When I was going to do the engagement, they said, bring six cloths. Also, for the year, you And I asked my wife, the six, how will they be distributed? Then they said, four will belong to my wife, two to my mother in law. Then I told her, okay. Then the two are the important thing. <laughs> but we are four. So let's borrow two and add. So we borrowed two. And we really wanted to pay back. So we borrowed two and added to the four to make six. When we finished, my mother-in-law had her two. It was now left to four. But the four belonged to my wife. And we had to pay for two of them. So I got another idea. I told my wife that instead of struggling to pay, Let's go and beg the woman to take them back. <laughs> so we went to the woman and we said, Mama, we can't pay. Her, so we want to return the cloth. She said, Oh, that's fine. She doesn't mind. So I told my wife, Let's return the tool and let's keep. <laughs> we got married in 1988. Mm. This is about 26 years. We are still there. Listen, there is no point in going to do a wedding. Ube Vienu, now Dika, 40,000. Ube Dekia, Mudin Tokwa, and Ebe Tiakam. Ube Soye Show. So, me, marriage blessing, I don't know how to do it. Child dedication. I'm not too sure whether to hold the child by the leg or the neck. <laughs> Burying, burial. I don't know how to do it. I may stand there and cry. Huh? So I can't bury the dead. Baptism. I'm not sure how long to keep you in the water. <laughs> to keep you in the water. Whether five minutes or ten minutes, I'm not sure. So if you think you are sure, you can. In the name of the Father. Then you say, when will he say, and of the Son? You are still down there. As Christ was, as Christ was buried, we are buried with Christ into his death. How long did he remain in the grave? So I will leave you in the water for three days.
Am I talking to somebody at all? So there are many things I can do. Now I was talking about the fear of financial support. We, we struggle. You, you don't need money to start ministry. And you don't need money to move in the things of the spirit. You don't even need money to travel and preach. Jesus said when you are going, don't take any quote or script. Just move. We have limited God to money. God told me, when you finish school, go and stay in Bogatanga and do ministry there. And I've been there since 1986. With no intentions of moving. To where? <laughs> I love the place. By the grace of God, tomorrow I'm going back. <laughs> Am I talking to you at all? Don't follow money and support. But when Jesus moved in his ministry, God raised people to support him. Amen. If you are doing the work of God, God will raise people to support you. God will raise people to support your family. God will raise people to support your business. God will raise people to support your education. Anybody who is here and you are going to school and you are not being supported, may God raise a supporter for you. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. The fear of the lack of support. Then the next fear, the fear of contamination. Many people are afraid to be contaminated. Oh, I don't want to contaminate my inheritance. I know men of God who are afraid to minister in the spirit, even anoint with oil, because they are saying if they do it, people will say they are also false prophets. I met a pastor who says, Oh, brothers, we really like your ministry. But don't you think that this use of the anointing oil you do and the mantles you pray over, don't you think people will classify you as one of these? I said, oh, I don't think so. The one I rather think they will use me to classify me with these um, people you call for. Is other things, and I think we will change. And I will stop the oil and stop the mantles. But there are other things I want to stop first because those people use them. One of them is that I have to change the name of our ministry because the name of our ministry is Fountain Gate Chapel. And some of these people, their names end with chapel. So I want to remove the chapel from the name of our ministry. So that people won't think I'm one. Meanwhile, this man, his name also had chapel. So now, he's standing there and staring at me. Then I said, another thing I want to change is that I realize they have been quoting Bible verses. And they've got Bibles in their hands. So I think I'll put away my Bible. I'll throw my Bible away and find another book. And I'll start quoting from other sources. Instead of the Bible. Because you see, they quote from the Bible. They said, no, you don't have to stop that. Then I said, no. Since they are using the Bible, people think I'm one of them. So I have to find another book. Then I told him, you know, what I'm trying to tell you is that it is not only the oil they use. It is not only prayer club they use. They use Bible. Their names are called ministry and chapel. If you want to run away from everything people are doing because somebody will say you are fake, you will have to even leave the Bible. The thing is, let God know your heart. Let God judge you. You'll be known by God and believe in what you are doing and stop following what people will think. And then he told me, he said, it should work as him. I rest my case. But you know what, people? You cannot fear contamination. A pastor can refuse to bring very good ministers to his pulpit because he's afraid. I don't want to bring somebody to come and pollute my ministry. They will not invite a prophet. They will not invite an apostle. They will not invite an evangelist. I know very nice churches. They will invite an evangelist. Almost say evangelist, you know, almost cast by heart. Oh, and the truth is that sometimes evangelists only to me can't send by. Mm. 
They are, they are not like pastors. Pastors are very careful about what they say. Evangelists say everything. You edit and take what you want. So when an evangelist is preaching, you must have a device that can do Photoshop. And when he shoots the thing, you take it and dress it. And bring it into a form that you can consume. Because they can say some things and you are like, ah, ah. The evangelist, they can use words. You understand? So, fear of contamination. Huh? God will be leading you in some way and you are like, oh no. I don't want to be as identified. I don't want to associate with this. So there is a man who is supposed to marry Boaz. Sorry, marry Ruth. In order that he will become a progenitor of Jesus. This man's name is given in the Bible as Ho, such a one. That is the way he is referred to as the book of Ruth. Ho, such a one. He was supposed to marry Ruth. When they called him and said, marry Ruth. He said, Ruth is a Moabitess. I cannot marry a Moabitess. She will mar my inheritance. She will spoil my inheritance. Take the opportunity to yourself. They call that man who is such a one. I've been saying that that man so disgraced himself that God refused to mention his name in the Bible and just said, Ho, such a one. Assume a um, Adiei, um, Wei, Betanasa. He passed on his birthright because he was afraid he will mar ma his inheritance. There are some of you who, in your mind, even marrying from another tribe is a problem for you. My wife is a Kwewu. I'm a Frafra. We married and we don't remember who is the Frafra, who is the Kwewu. I don't see her as a Southern. She doesn't see me as a Northern. We are fine. We are fine. My wife is very comfortable being in the North. Some of you can't imagine. No. If you are sitting home today and your daughter comes to say, I'm marrying somebody from Nigeria. You say, nah, nah. Who say, nah, then? <laughs> or you are from Nigeria. And your son comes and says, I have seen a Ghanaian. Because Nigerians call us Ghanaian. They don't say Ghanaians. They can't say the Ghanaian. They say Ghanaian. I have seen Ghanaian woman. I want to marry. Hey, Ghana what? A lady was going to do her national service in, her, in the north. And the mother warned her. The mother is a believer. Warned her. Where you go, make sure you don't go and come back and say you are, you are marrying a man from the north. The lady said, Mama, why? She said, hey, it's too far. <laughs> then the lady asked the mother, so if I go there, and the mother is a charismatic Christian, and she knows me. So, the, the, the daughter said, Mommy, so if I go, and I see Reverend Eastwood and have a son, and he wants to marry me, what should I do? She said, ah, but that's a different thing. Well, oh, you. The tribalism, you, you see, tribalism, ethnicity, racism, they are some of the things that destroy things of the spirit. That is why the Bible says we are born again, not of flesh and not of blood, not of the will of man. But we are born of water and we are born of the spirit. If you are still tribalist or racist, you are not born again. Most of my friends are Ashantis, Kwaus, Gans, Elwes. When I'm walking around, I can count the number of Northerners around me because you see, I'm not, I'm not a tribalist. Some of us, the tribalism is too much. In Ghana, Nanso yekwa brochure na de yeye eye ya You can see somebody in Ghana who looks down on other tribes If I, if I me the reason I find it difficult to get that problem is I come from the north People from the south look down on the people from the north When you come to the north the people in the north look down on my people called the frafres Among the frafres the rest of the frafres look down on my group called the Nabdams. 
So in fact, I belong to the <laughs> shishi. Everyone say shishi. You see rice. When they do the rice huh, and the kanzo. And to me, I don't fear tribalism, racism. They say he that is down needs fear no fall. I have never gone abroad and I'm worried about tribalism. Mm -mm. That word nigger, black man, uh, he's an African. He doesn't do me anything. Or I'm walking about and they say, oh, this guy has an accent. Mm -mm. Doesn't trouble me. One day I was in the US, I went into a shop with a Ghanaian who is from the south, a fanti. We went into a shop and the white boys, when we went to the first shop, they said, um, we can help you. Um, you 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 got to go to um, AT and T. Within a short time, they have finished what they are saying. <laughs> the man got annoyed. He said they are looking down on us because we are blacks. He lives there. We went to a second shop. He got angry again. He said they are discriminating, and he started fighting them. We were now going to the third shop. I told him, I said, my brother, <laughs> that third shop we are going. Don't fight the people. Say, oh, Reverend Jude, you don't understand. They are looking down on us. You don't, you don't live here, so you don't understand this racism something. I left him here. I said, wait, stand. You are a fanti. I'm a frafra. I don't understand racism. I said, do you know the tribalism I deal with in Ghana? Where you are? I said, in Ghana, you, your people look down on us. Is it not it? And you call it pepe for now you have come here. They call you nigger. You are annoyed. <laughs> I said, you know what? Me mom dear, when I come here and they call all of us nigger, I feel good though because over here, look, there is no Ashanti nigger, no Fanti nigger, no Frafra nigger, no Dagomba nigger. Over here, nigger than nigger. So I said, that's for me. When I come here, what I enjoy is a nigger. When I go with Reverend Wedi Dangwa and I am Anaba, white man doesn't know that. No. Black man, a black man. We are both niggers. I am a tall nigger, he's a shorter nigger. Nigger na nigger. And incidentally, sometimes even among the whites, you know, get up. Daphne, get up. Daphne comes from the north. She's a man pretty girl. Where do you come from? From the uh, west. West. Which of them look black? <laughs> Which of them is a black man? Or you may be seated. So sometimes you can even come from the north and look fairer. So you are even nearer the black American. Look, sometimes neighbor be how keke. Like sometimes I come to the south and they call somebody Pepe Ni. Now go fu. Why should they call me Pepe? What should they call it? <laughs> now, incidentally, Pepe, is it an insult? What is the meaning of Pepe? I don't even know. Somebody told me that the reason why they call them Pepe is only a pain pain. And there's a Pepe Ni. And then somebody too said the way they call them Ntafuan, when they come from the north, they used to wear the same dress so that they can identify themselves and one won't get lost. So I see Ntafuan, Omo dress it is Ntafuan. They are like twins. And the way I obviously, or you're telling me, or you're peeping, now we're full. Now we're charging our wounds in our worship. My brain is not pepe. My spirit is not pepe. My soul is not pepe. Am I, am I talking to you? Or oh, nigger, nigger. I'm looking at the white man standing there and telling me nigger. I'm born again. What are you? You are telling me I'm a nigger. Ah, uh -uh. Jack. When I go to preach in my friend Pastor Rod Parsley's church. I know they'll be thinking about accent. And some of them will even listen. They'll be like, this is a black man talking. So when I stand in that great pulpit, 
I don't take few of my books. I carry all. And then I say, these are my books. When I finish, go and buy the book and read. And I told them, the reason why you read is because book has no accent. <laughs> and, I te- and I tell them, I wrote all this. And they are like, hmm. We must listen to him. Because a fool doesn't write 65 books. Even if he's a black man, he can't be a fool. So no matter who you are, you have to sit up. Then I tell them, I said, when we are watching movies in Ghana, even John Wayne, we understand what he's trying to say. Hey, boys, move it. Move. I know Swaziga, Swaziga, we force to understand what he's saying. Because we want to watch the movie. And I said, you know what, in Africa, we work through your American accent in order to understand a movie. Over here, I'm carrying something more than a movie. I'm carrying an anointing. You must work through the accent to get the anointing. And don't sit there and be thinking about accent. Everybody's on their feet. They are clapping. They are falling under the power. They are getting healed. They are receiving impartations. The power of the Holy Ghost is upon them. Sometimes don't let this kind of discrimination. You are going to marry somebody. Hey, I will marry her. I'm a university. I, I have my masters. This girl just went to polytechnic. Are you marrying polytechnic? Oh, I have master's education. But the man I want to marry, he, the guy's education is not high. And he, he, he just went to polytechnic. Are you going to marry a husband or a lecturer? <laughs> eh? So if Cristiano Ronaldo was coming to marry you, will you be asking his education? A bomba. Oh, somebody's coming to marry you. What work do you do? Oh, I'm a pastor. <laughs> I'll pray about it. <laughs> Look, they avoid pastors like plagues. <laughs> because they believe if you marry a pastor, poverty is going to pursue you. <laughs> and then Obi Abed you at him. So I'm afraid I'll contaminate my whatever. Sometimes you get a very good friend, you are afraid to relate to the person because you are afraid you'll be contaminated. Now, let me go to the fear of history. That is my last chapter the fear of history. People use history to frighten you, they'll tell you somebody spoke in tongues and got mad. When we were in second school, we used to hear those stories. Hey, stop speaking in tongues. There was a boy here last year. He spoke in tongues. He got mad. And I used to tell them, there are people who came to study in the university, and they also got mad. So does it mean we should stop studying? Is that okay? And then if you are in America, they will warn you about Jim Jones. They will warn you about David Koresh. If you are in Switzerland, they will warn you about Jack um, Locke Juliet. And they'll tell you that all these people were, were false people. Like Juret, they'll tell you they killed people, they committed genocide, they did this and this, and beware of false prophets. Let's close our meeting today by looking at Acts chapter 5, verse 34 to 41. And I have preached a whole book today. <laughs> Acts chapter 5. They wanted to stop the apostles from ministry. And this is what happened. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, hard in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. Verse 35. And he said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourself what you intend to do as touching this 
these men. For before these days, there arose, there rose up Judas, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew much people after him, he also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone, for if this counsel or work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found to fight against God. Leave these men alone. If what they are doing is of men, it will collapse. But if it is of God, you cannot stop it, lest you be found fighting against God. God. In all your life, may God help you. Never by thought, by your word, or by your hands to fight against the work of God or fight against a man of God. By thought, by word, by hand, may you never fight against a man of God or a work of God with your mind, with your mouth, or with your hand. Everybody say my mind, my mouth, or my hands will never fight against a man of God, a woman of God, or the work of God. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Stand to your feet. God bless you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this message. For further inquiries, contact World Prayer Center, P.O. Box, GP21421, Accra, or telephone, plus 233-303-413-703, or plus 233-303-413-705. Email us on info at wpcministries.org, or visit our website at www.wpcministries.org.